Well, good morning. Welcome to Valley Harvest. Would you stand with us as we begin our service singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Sing open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we see.
I would like to invite the Harvest Kids, the first through sixth graders, to go ahead and be dismissed and grafted roots as well. And go ahead and be seated, please, while Pastor David comes up and reads our scripture for the day. I'd like to turn your attention to Philippians chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11 this morning out of the English Standard Version. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with the, me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the, and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may be able to prove what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Thank you, David. Will you please stand with us as we continue to sing? Savior, I come, quiet my soul. blood was spilled my ransom everything I once held dear I count it all as long lead me to the cross where your love poured out bring me to my Lord, I lay me down and rid me of myself. I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Lead me to the cross. and try you the word became flesh for my sin 
What do you pray for most, most often? What do you pray for? Right now, I'm praying for water. Mm. We've been going through the book of Philippians. Today, we're in verse 9 through 11, and we're going to look at a, a prayer of Paul. But it's an interesting question when you think about what you pray for most, most often. The Apostle Paul was passionate about the spiritual de development of people, and therefore, he was passionate about prayer. If you read his letters in the New Testament, Paul is always praying for the church he deeply loved, and he is equally encouraging them to pray continually with him. Pastor John MacArthur points out that of all the things that, that Paul prayed for in the church, in church, physical needs or church growth was not one of them. It was not that those things were unimportant to him, but the spiritual issues were of supreme importance. And his desire for this Philippian church was for them to enjoy the same blessings that he did. As he writes this letter, he is in prison, and yet he is content. He is in prison, but he's happy. He has learned the secret of being content in every circumstance, faith in Christ Jesus and his unfolding plan. Paul knows that God causes everything to work together for the good to those that love God. He knows that God who began a good work in you, within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. But even though the apostle takes great comfort in knowing that God is in control, he doesn't just kick back in his jail cell and wait for God to do all the work in this Philippian church. On the contrary, he prays for them regularly. And reason ends up begging the question, why bother? Why bother praying? Isn't it all predestined anyways? Pastor Jeff Thomas notes that Paul's praying for the Philippian church was a means God used to finish the work God had begun. 
What greater incentive to praying could there be than knowing this fact, that our asking God to help people is itself the machinery God has designed to start and complete his work in those people's lives. My friends, if you're a Christian, I want you to know that prayer is absolutely vital to your life here today. A feeble prayer life is the marker of a feeble spiritual life. And if you check yourself into a hospital, the first thing they're going to check on you is your body temperature, your pulse rate, your respiration rate, and your blood pressure. They call this checking your vitals, right? Likewise, they, they, you know, there are key vital signs that you can look for if you want to know how your spiritual life is doing, and prayer is at the top of that list. The first mark of a life in a newborn child is that he breathes and he cries. So the first mark of men and women who are born again is that they pray. And the Holy Spirit, who makes them alive, gives them, this, gives them a voice God says you need mercy every day, and you need grace in every, every day as you need it. You feel emptiness. You feel your weakness. You have to pray. You must pray, my friends. What Christian in the Bible do we know of that did not pray? What servant of God in the history of the church didn't pray? And so Paul prays for this church. Now, what specific things does Paul pray for? Number one, notice that he prays that their love will grow more and more. And verse 9, he says, and it is my prayer that your love may abound. That word abound is overflow more and more with knowledge and all discernment. He prays that their love will grow more and more because all that distinguishes you as a true Christian is seen in your capacity to love people. That's because this kind of distinguishing love comes only from the Holy Spirit's influence upon the Christian heart. Paul says in Romans 5, 5, that God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And this kind of godly love comes from God so that anyone who has been born again will demonstrate this special capacity to love even their enemies. This kind of love is more than a feeling warm or this or sentimental towards people. And it's more than merely saying, I love you, but rather it's demonstrated by our actions. It's more than getting. It's about giving. Think about the greatest example you've ever seen where love was most clearly demonstrated. And there's no greater example I can think of than when Jesus Christ, God's Son, voluntarily laid down his life for his enemies as he was crucified on a cross. Thus Paul says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet still sinners. The apostle Peter writes that Christ suffered once for sins for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death but he was raised to life in the spirit. You know why? Because love is always demonstrated by sacrifice. And through his prayer, Paul is encouraging us here today to allow God to keep widening our love for other people as he empowers us to give more and more of ourselves for the sake of others. Do you want your love to look like this? Do you want this kind of love? Is it at the top of your prayer list for yourself, for your family, and for your church family? Perhaps you feel that you already love people enough, and caring about them causes certain inconveniences and heartaches. Your schedule is full, and your emotional reservoir is low, low, so you can't possibly take on more folks' problems. I get it. I understand. But I want you to know here, my friend, if that's you, you're not alone. None of us has the capacity to love people perfectly on our own. None of us do. But here's the good news. God does. That's why Paul makes this prayer request to God. This is a kind of love that is only possible when God lives inside yours and my heart. And if you're truly his child, he will keep stretching your heart to love more and more. He longs to do it. So pray for God to grow your love more and more and pray for your church to do the same. But notice what Paul says here, that love as an emotion is not enough. And so Paul encourages you, number two, to pray that your love will be based in knowledge and understanding. 
He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. That's the growth. But it needs to grow with knowledge, and he uses the word discernment here. You see, it's not enough just to say, I love people. In fact, singing that, singing that all you need is love, love, because love is all you need, may have sold the Beatles a lot of records and made them a lot of money, but it doesn't work in the real world. It's overly simplistic, isn't it? Love must be directed by knowledge or else it becomes superficial, shallow, right? Like a man who only loves a woman for her body. If the only love I know arises from just my sentiments and emotions, my feelings, then it's going to be ruined the first time I go unsatisfied. Martin Lloyd-Jones, pastor of Westminster Chapel in London back in, back in World War II, so there are two temptations which constantly confront us in the Christian life. One, of the danger, one is the danger of living merely on our experiences and feelings, and the other is the danger of having a purely intellectual interest in the Bible and Christianity. And the way to avoid these two extremes is to allow our love to grow with knowledge and understanding. Paul here, talking to these Philippian Christians, He's anxious that they should know and understand the significance of the death of Jesus on the cross and the power of his resurrection and the application of all that to our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul wants us to see that God from the very beginning had this plan which he is certainly working out. And here's the thing is as you grasp that plan more fully, it begins to increase your love for God. And as we have this growing assurance of our great salvation, so our love will grow more and more. And the more we know of that love, and the more we will be able to face disappointments and troubles that meet us in life. You see, if I only know a love which arises from my sentiments and my feelings, my emotions, then when I'm upset, I'm not going to have anything to fall back upon. But if I believe the doctrine that what finally saves me is not my feelings, but the finished work of Christ upon the cross, then whatever I may feel, I know that I can stand and I can go forward. If I believe the very hairs on my head are all numbered, and if I believe that all things work together for the good through a process that will ultimately complete me and make me perfect, and if I believe all this, then I have I have a way to look at life in a, in a new way. I have the ability to see all my unfortunate circumstances as God's chiseling work in my life. So, friends, it's a great thing to grasp this truth. And as I do, the greater, as I do, the greater my love for God and, and those who are with me and this great glorious process. So, Knowledge is vital in directing our love. But the apostle Paul also says that it's not just shaped by knowledge. Notice the word discernment. I'm using the word understanding here. How are knowledge and understanding different? The word that Paul uses here for understanding or discernment, whatever your Bible translation says, means a moral understanding which guides the actions and the words of those who are wise. Have you ever met someone who was uh, smart and stupid at the same time? Yeah? People who are highly intelligent but only have one oar in the water? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Paul prays that our love will be shaped by knowledge and understanding. Because without knowledge and understanding, love does not know how to express itself in a ways that are appropriate to each situation in life. He prays that these the Philippians, that their love may be guided by knowledge and understanding so that they will know how to make the best choices. Because if you allow God to grow your love and knowledge and understanding, number three, then you will have the ability to recognize what is best. And so Paul says in the Philippians 1.10, I pray in this so that you may approve what is excellent. What is excellent? Have you ever had to make a major purchase that required you to evaluate the different features between two different products. Like, if you were considering purchasing a car, you would likely evaluate which features are most essential to your current life situation, right? I mean, as a matter of fact, it would be wise of you to sort out your priorities based on your current needs. If you arrive at the dealership clueless, 
and just go with the car that makes you feel good when you drive it, it is highly likely that you will end up purchasing a vehicle that doesn't best meet your needs. And you need to have the ability to recognize what is best for you before you go to the dealership. I was Wayne Chapman, who manages Chevrolet, was in here first service when I said that. He said, no, you don't. <laughs> That's why, right? It's best to know, know what you need before you go there. And the same is true with the Christian life, isn't it? Paul is telling these Philippian Christians that if we're not careful, we can easily fall into the trap of focusing all of our energy on things that are not really all that important. He's saying, I want you to understand what really matters. Because how prone we are as human beings to waste our time and energy on pursuing things that don't really matter. We often tend to forget things that are most essential and give our attention to every bell and whistle that we hear. I heard it once said that the art of being wise is the art of knowing what to overlook. We've all been guilty at one time or another of allowing things that are seemingly good to distract us from what's best for our spiritual growth, haven't we? Think about the way we use our cell phones. Thanks to modern technology, we have the ability to be more connected with other people than ever. But while those connections are good, they can also be distractions, can't they? The Deloitte Global Mobile Consumer Survey found that 61% of Americans check their cell phone messages for, for messages, emails, and social media notifications within five, per, five minutes of first waking up. 61%. If you, if you wait for 30 minutes, that number goes up to 88%. And I asked myself, why do you think that is? And the one thing I could conclude was that we want to hear what's new in the world, and we want to know who's taking notice of us overnight. And many times we want to avoid thinking about boredom, about responsibilities, and about the hardships that the day is going to be present with us. Martin Lloyd Jones says, we need power to concentrate on what is vital, to leave out everything else, and to keep steady to the one thing that matters. And what is that one thing? Paul tells us in Philippians 3.10, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. That was the one thing which the apostle regarded as vital. It was knowing Christ Jesus in, in both his glorious resurrection and in the suffering, and in, in the darkness of his suffering. That's the one thing that really matters here today, is to know Christ. And so... And so Paul he now says in his prayer, that is the one thing that you people must concentrate on. There may be many other things in your life, but make certain that that is always at the center. For if you know the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, whatever else may come to you, whatever may happen to you, you'll be safe. You'll be spiritually safe. And these are the things which are vital and all important. And what a tragedy is, isn't it? that we should waste so much time with organizations and institutions and all the things that belong in the margins of the Christian life. If you want the ability to recognize what's best, you need to let your love grow with knowledge and understanding. Then, number four, you will, have, you will be pure and without blame in the day of Christ Jesus. Then you will be pure and blame without blame until the day of Christ Jesus returns. Notice that Paul says, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. What's Paul telling us? He's telling us that if we are willing to work with God in increasing our capacity to love, with love, knowledge, and understanding, we will naturally begin to cultivate a pure and a blameless life. It flows out of that. The word that Paul uses here for purity is rooted in another word that refers to the shining splendor of the sun, so that in its fullest sense, it means to be tested by the light of the sun, completely pure, spotless. In essence, Paul is praying that by our love and knowledge of God, we will become a people who have sincere motives and spotless lives. And to be blameless is to be someone that doesn't cause others to stumble or to fall into sin. Guys, 
You know, it's a rare occasion that someone who is walking with God will fall into sin without some process that leads up to it. No, falling in sin usually into sin usually happens in stages. It begins by tolerating some temptation or behavior that we know to be sinful. We may criticize it, but yet we put up with it. And I can't begin to tell you how many well-meaning Christians I've known who for the sake of showing Christ's love to someone continue to tolerate the very sinful behavior that eventually ensnared them and drug them down. They were trying to do a good thing by loving an unbeliever and being there for them, but they didn't have the wisdom they needed to know where to draw the line. Love needs knowledge, doesn't it? This is why we need to pray along with Paul that our love will grow with knowledge and understanding. By knowing Christ and pursuing a life that matters, guess what? You end up living this pure and blameless life and you live it in view of the day of Christ, Philippians 1.10, in view of his day. So that's the wise life Paul is talking about. That's a life like Jesus who always did what pleases the Father. Paul desires for his people to be fit and prepared for the coming day of Christ, and so he prays for them to be pure and blameless. And what better motivation can you find to consistently live a pure and blameless life than daily reminding yourself that Jesus Christ might return this very day? You see, if you really believe all that the Bible says about who Jesus is and and that he might return at any moment, it will very well change the way you live your life. I mean, John says in John, 1 John 3.10 that when we have that hope of his return, that it helps us keep ourselves pure. And on that day when Jesus does return to gather his people to himself, he's going to inspect each of our lives. And his judgment is going to be directly related to how you allowed him to grow your, your love and your knowledge of him and his plan for your life. And my question for you, my friend, is what is he going to find on that day? What is he going to find? See, if you are daily growing your love and knowledge of God, you can rest assured knowing, number five, that Jesus Christ will produce the fruit of right living in you. Jesus Christ will produce the fruit of right living in you. So Paul says in Philippians 1.11 that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that com- comes through Jesus Christ. Notice where it comes. It comes through Jesus. Do you see within yourself a growing hunger for, to know God and to live a life that honors him? Whether you do or not, one must wonder, why do some people have this growing hunger to know God more than others? Desiring to know God is not a universal sentiment, which is why Paul prays that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep growing in your knowledge and understanding. He knows that God has to produce this kind of hunger in your life, and when you respond to this work, your life will produce a righteous character through Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul says that that fruit is produced. It is produced through Jesus Christ. So Jesus says in John 15, 16, as to his disciples, he tells them directly, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. If it is God who is at work in you, given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him, what credit can you take for that? My friends, if you belong to my master Jesus, you will produce the fruit of righteousness if you belong to him. If your life is not producing this fruit, then you have every reason to be fearful. Which is why Paul says in Philippians 2.12, he tells us to work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with a deep reverence and fear. And Jesus says again in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, he says you can identify people by their fruit, that is by the way they act. Jesus asks, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce good fr- a bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, Jesus says, 
Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Guys, my master Jesus, he's the unique only son of God. He came to this earth to make a way for your life to bear the kind of fruit that the Father created you to produce. And and as God's son, he has the power to do it. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, our lives produce a lot of bad fruit, right? I mean, selfish moods, self-defeating habits, white lies, misuse of our time, angry outbursts, the binges we go on, Some of us are people pleasers, substance abusers. We struggle with bitterness and cheating. We struggle with gossip and neglect. We struggle with overall bad attitudes, right? And here's the thing. Jesus can change the kind of fruit that you are producing. But it doesn't start where you might think. He doesn't try to take your current fruit in your life and make it look better by cleaning it up. He doesn't take the bruises off off that piece of fruit and and cut the bruise off that fruit and try to make it look a little more appealing. No. He goes straight to the source. He goes to the root. He goes to your desires, the things that you love and the things that grip your heart. That's where he starts. And as your knowledge of him begins to grow, so your love for him and his work in your life will grow, even when it's painful. And then... Your life will bring glory and praise to God, number six. I underlined the wrong one there in Philippians 1.11. He says, then after you're filled, you're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, your life will bring this glory and praise to God. You know, this is the whole reason why God made you in all your unique abilities and qualities. God made you for himself, and he is determined to make a way for you to be his. Jesus had to die on a cross in order to take away all of your bad fruit. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Jesus was buried and raised from the dead three days later. And now all who trust in his death and resurrection can produce this righteous life that brings glory and praise to God. See, it's like a seed that has to die and be put in the ground in order to become something different and live a new kind of life. We have to die to our old identity and become what God made us to be. And Jesus is offering you that new identity here today. He's offering it to you. The question is, will you join him in his cause? What kind of fruit is your life producing? See, the good news is that God designed you for him. And when you pray that your love will grow and abound more and more, and and when you pray that that love will be directed by the knowledge that you're growing in and the discernment, understanding, do you really think God's going to say no, no, no? You're going to be a miserable wretch your whole life. You're not going to get to love anybody, and you're going to be the dumbest brick on earth. No, that's not what God's going to do. He wants to do this in you. How do you begin this relationship with him? The Bible says, number one, you've got to believe. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That word belief is not just an intellectual assent to some kind of fact. It is a trust, a wholehearted trust in his work and what he did, that you are made right with God by him and him alone. Number two, you've got to confess. Romans 10, 9 says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God has raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. Saved from what? From that, fruit, from that bad fruit in your life and from its results of destruction. But you've got to confess. You've got to tell somebody what it means. Tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. By the way, on November 17th, we're going to do baptisms again. That's a good way to tell people about what Jesus has done for you, isn't it? And number three, you need to repent. That word repent means you just turn from your old ways, your old life. 
Now, don't think that Jesus is saying you've got to repent before you can come to him. No, you can't. You repent after you come to him. You believe, you confess, then you come to him, and he helps you with that process of, rep- of turning your life into him, over to him. What kind of fruit are you going to bear? I'm going to ask the worship team would come forward as they get ready to lead us in a song. The Lord Jesus has spoken here this morning through his word. Has he not? He's spoken through his apostle Paul through his word. Now it's up to you. What are you going to do? See, you're free to choose to do whatever you want here today. Accept his offer to produce new fruit in your life and change your identity. Or walk out, keep producing the same old stinking stuff you've been producing and everything up to this point in your life. But you're forced to make a decision. You can't walk out and say, I've never heard that. He loves you and he offers this to you. What will be your decision here today? I, I, I will be down front, and we're going to sing a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it's a joyous song. It is. Because Jesus is our friend who allows us to bring everything in prayer to him. Some of you guys can just stay there and sing that. Some of you guys need to come up and we need to pray together. And some of you might need to enter into this relationship with Jesus for the first time. If that's you, I will invite you to come forward. Stand with me. I'm going to pray. They're going to start singing. I'll be down there. If you need to pray with me, I'll be here. My dear Heavenly Father, we confess our absolute neediness of your work in our life, Lord Jesus. That fruit comes through you. And we ask that you would grow our love to be even deeper than it was when we came in here. And Lord, let that love be tempered with knowledge and understanding. Lord, help us to live pure and blameless lives through that love and knowledge. And Lord, may you fill us with fruit of righteousness so that we'll be ready on that day when you come. Lord, help us to recognize what's best and bring all praise and glory and honor to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Praise and live this.
Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we have that promise that you are always there for us, that your love for us will never fail. God, thank you that we can come before you and cast our cares on you and lift our burdens to you. And God, thank you for the reminders in that song about the peace that we often forfeit, the needless pain that we bear when we don't lay our cares on you. God, help us to put down everything we have at your feet, knowing that you are an amazingly big God that can control everything in this universe, and you hold us in the palm of your hand. God, I just thank you for this time we have come together this morning, that we can worship you in singing, in studying your word, and now in giving of our tithes and offerings. Lord, I just pray that everything that is done here today would be for your glory and your praise. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Sisters. 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 Sometimes we need a key, a shiny, cold, metallic piece of freedom to untangle us from the locks we are holding. The locks that are shouting relentless propaganda to convince us we are stuck, discontent, unlovable, destined to be slaves to expectation and exhaustion, vanished to small spaces, cages, convincing us our wings are clipped, when the truth is, we have simply forgotten how to fly. You are not the caged or the clipped. You are the kind of thing that flies. And this is the year to stretch your wings. Because freedom is exhilarating, but it isn't tidy. Just like science still can't explain yawning or why a bumblebee can flip through the sky, your freedom flight will not come through acts of reason or force. It is a hand-me-down present from a good God that is meant to be savored, not a trophy to be put in a case. Freedom is no trophy. It is a wild and unpredictable first draft. So if your life does not equal up to the vision you have, then start over. Take the uncharted paths. Draw new boundaries because you are a compass of a woman. And your off the beaten path decisions will be breadcrumbs for others, your scars, a roadmap to another woman's freedom. Which is why this year at MOPS, we choose wild, unexpected freedom. The kind that brings more laughter and less worry. More contentment and less hustling. Freedom that is so contagious the people around us are compelled toward their own liberation. This year, we will realize that we have more control over our lives than we thought. We will train our tongues to love the taste of salt. We will let love be the loudest voice. We will remember that just because we have a bad day doesn't mean we have a bad life. We will go first in order to set other captives free. And we will raise our gutsy banners, lock our arms, and proclaim that fear and worry and anxiety and comparison will not win. We will be a force to be reckoned with because we are no longer caged or clipped. We are committed to fly. And this is the year we stretch our wings. So take to the skies and be, be free, free indeed. indeed. Welcome to Iron Chef Valley Harvest. Today's culinary battle is between Julia Childress. Hello, everyone. And Farmer Fred. Howdy, y'all. Contestants, today you'll be responsible for making a two-course meal, including chili and dessert. My mm. favorites. Contestants, are you ready? You bet. Yep. 45 How minutes much chili remain. powder did you put in there? Enough. What are you what? making over there? I am making my famous apple pie. Hey, let's see here, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I think I'm almost complete. 15 minutes remaining. Four, three, two, one. All done. <sighs> Phew, I did it. Well, that certainly was a hot one. You guys put up a, a good culinary battle. Let's see what the judges have to say. All right, the judges have voted. Okay. It's the, the moment of truth. And the winner is... Farmer Fred! What? Oh my lands. Yeah. Farmer Fred, you've just won Iron Chef Valley Harvest. What are you gonna do now? I'm going square dancing. 
Join us Sunday, September 10th in Faith Hall for Family Night. If you've got a chili or a dessert that you'd like to enter, come at 3.30 for check-in. From 4 to 5, we'll be tasting those scrumptious meals and yummy desserts and voting for which you think is best. From 5 to 6, we'll be eating and enjoying fellowship with one another while we hear who won the cook-off. And from 6 to 7.30, we'll be square dancing with a live caller. So come on down and enjoy this fun evening with us. Yeehaw! When you made the decision to follow Christ, something inside of you woke up. Your soul was alive for the first time. The decision was very personal. That first spark of life was just between you and Jesus, but it couldn't stay hidden for long. God's presence has affected every part of your life, bringing light to even the darkest places. And now, it's time to let it show. Baptism is your opportunity to shine brightly before your friends, your family, the world. It's time to say, I've buried my old life. My new life has begun. Baptism is a declaration. It's a line in the sand. It's time to let God's light shine for everyone to see. Won't you stand with us as we close our service singing and give us clean hands? Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O oh, Spirit.
Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, and God let us be a generation that seeks, to seek your face, O oh God of Jacob. Generation that sees the seeds your face, O oh God of Jacob. And give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us now lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us now lift our souls to another. And God, let us be. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, O God of Jacob. He'll do that if you are sincere in your prayer to him. You can guarantee he'll do that. So let's close in prayer. Father God, how we need you to cleanse our heart from, Lord, every, every deed that doesn't glorify you, every bad attitude. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would grow our love so that it would overflow more and more into the lives of other people and that you would help us to discern your will and to have the knowledge we need, Lord, to recognize what's best. And Lord, we ask that, that in that, you would help us to live pure and blameless lives that produce righteous fruit. Lord, that we would give you all the praise and the glory. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.